have him from our senior field here. He's a fifth generation. His family has been here five generations in South Orange. So if anyone is an expert on what has been and what about South Orange, he is as well as working, did you say 60 years? For I didn't say working. I mean, not working. <laughs> <laughs> Are you ready? Made my first faux pas. Okay, 60 years, well, okay. senior field has been with Seton Hall University, and it's such a fine university. I'm sure he has been a terrific actor. <laughs> And you can know how long ago that was. My mother and father gave me a ten dollar bill, said, Go up, buy your books and bring back the change. <laughs> so you can see how long ago that was. And I must apologize, I made a little mnemonic in my mind. I saw friends of South Orange Library, I said, Well that spells fossil. But I realized I was wrong out there. Absolutely. So forgive me for that uh, momentary aberration. Uh, Mrs. Cobb was good enough to say that there will be no questions until the speaker says questions. That might mean there will be no questions. But uh, I am very conscious, friends of the South Orange Library, of the fact that I am no expert. Living around doesn't make you an expert. I suppose the best expert in South Orange might be the garbage man, because he probably knows more about more people and their secrets than all the rest of us. Uh, but if there are questions, uh, I might maybe ask Mrs. Crack or Mrs. O'Rourke or people like that to answer the questions, or Mrs. Connolly's here, because they are the real experts. I'm just a passerby on this scene. Uh, but I am, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and I must tell you this. Now, uh, Mrs. Cow doesn't even know this, but I am paying a debt. I was in prep for four years and spent four afternoons a week in this library reading the Illustrated London News. Oh. 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 that nobody else could afford in those days. And the happy hours I spent in this library, rain and shine, were up in the, uh, the second floor, those little niche seats around the windows, and it was absolute paradise for kids in the prep school. So, I'm paying a debt that way, and I'm sure you understand, huh? Uh, I don't think I have to qualify, qualify myself, but I think I had better uh, in view of what's been said. But my uh, great-grandmother ran a paper mill uh, down uh, in that, uh, down where the, that, uh, at, uh, no, uh, Gleason, where, where the, uh, the uh, tailor is. Gleason, is that his name? And, uh, and she had a, her house still stands on Jefferson Street. Uh, and that day there wasn't much distinction between South Orange and Maplewood. Uh, my grandparents were married in the Seton Hall Chapel. Uh, my great-grandfather on the first board of trustees of the university. And I have always lived either in South Orange or in its perimeter. Uh, and when I didn't live, I used it just the same. Uh, I uh, had very good friends in the, with the Grays and the Orchids and the Hoyts, and they would always allow me to use their address when I came up to play tennis to use the swimming pool. So that, uh, <laughs> uh, I think the policeman probably understood, certainly Jim Farrell did, uh, but uh, he, he never uh, never objected. But I don't know how many of you are newcomers and how many are old, but uh, uh, I think in, in terms, for example, of the old Village Inn, does anybody remember the Village Inn? Yes. Most wonderful restaurant. Definitely. And you might remember uh, the owner was a black lady who employed her former employer as the maitre d' in the, in the inn. It was a marvelous place. Uh, up there where Gertrude Levy's is, alone there somewhere. Oh, uh, Dr. Dr. Warren had his house. Yeah. <coughs> and of course, there was the wonderful Cameo Theater, where Dr. Salino used to act as an usher before he became a doctor. So that, uh, this is really all part of, of the South Orange that, that I know. The cameo, by the way, was exactly like the theater over in Maplewood. The two of them were identical, and I was hoping they'd close the Maplewood theater and keep the cameo open. <laughs> but we lost on that one, I'm afraid. Huh? Uh, and I was, I was thinking in, in, in these terms, too, and please believe, uh, dear friend, there's nothing scientific about this. You're stuck. 
for the reminiscence of somebody whose mind has lapses now and then, and uh, I'm sure that some of you will recognize perhaps some inaccuracies, because most of what I talk about is legend. I listen very carefully to my mother, and I listen carefully to my grandmother, and I listen to my friends, and it's amazing what you can pick up just by listening. Uh, for example, does anybody uh, here, except maybe uh, Mrs. Krecker, know what Eddie Joostix was? What? Eddie Joostix. He was the heart of the village. He ran the swamp line from Main Street to the South Orange Station. And he put all the girls off at Rosemont that came up from downtown Nurk on Main Street and came across on the swamp line. And you may know that the swamp line was the actual original of the Tunerville trolley. Uh, when the uh, cartoonist began, he chose the swamp line as his model. And in those very nice days, too, along the the old bed of the swamp by the public service store, or the traffic transfer, it still has that uh, franchise to the village. Mrs. Connolly's here. Come on up. You take oh, over. Okay. <laughs> That's the third of the ladies of those far more than I do. But it used to be wonderful. Uh, they had signal lights along the tracks. And you could come out on your uncle's porch and look down. If the light was red, you would get down there fast because the swamp line was coming. I never heard that it went off the tracks. But it went over water, it went over places where ties were missing, and it was really a, a very interesting sort of thing. Uh, I remember, too, uh, the trolley that used to come up from Newark, and then you changed at the, at the uh, city line, and then you went up, and the trolley was on the, on the sidewalk side of the streets. The road was in the middle, and so you could, very nice, you could step from the trolley into security. If you try it now, you step off into oblivion. But uh, <laughs> the other system was much better. And then after it swung around into Valley Street, I would think around 3rd Street, it went into single trackage. And then it went out to a split, and one car had to wait for the other, coming back from Maywood and going out to Maywood. And in the summertime, they had the most marvelous open cars, with the great nine seats across. Uh, I didn't have much money. I used to ride on the back bumper. And when the motorman stopped, he put the steps down. If you ran fast and sat on the steps, he couldn't get them up again. So we rode on the back steps of the trolley car until my mother caught me. And that was, the end of, that, was the, that was the end of that particular adventure. And for us, too, as, as uh, little children, uh, the line ended over in the village dumps in Maplewood, and they had the most fascinating things in those dumps. Uh, <laughs> you get over one trolley and spend an hour picking, and then get back on the trolley and come back to this, uh, this side of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the swamp line. Uh, anybody remember the old Noonan taxis? Now I think we have four or five different taxi lines who are never at the station, I've noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Newtons were always there, and uh, they used to have the rent liveries for funerals. And I think when the last Newton taxi driver was 97, they went out of business. Uh, that, that was all I could do for that. And of course, uh, 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 more recently than that, and I guess the franchise still exists, the public service used to run a bus from the South Orange Station to New York. What is South Orange Avenue? To Center Street and across Center Street? Not across No. No, well, this went over Center Street and down Main Street and then that way. And that was all you know, All along Center Street, you get out and step on the bus and go. So it was really wonderful, huh? Uh, if this is disjointed, remember, it is just a kind of personal reminiscences. A new book has just come out uh, called Win uh, Berlin by Len Dayton. And in the book are two brothers, the Winters brothers, one of whom becomes a Nazi and one worked for the CIA. When I was a little boy, there were two Winters houses, not really in South Orange. One Winter house was at the corner of Tremont and Center, and the other was at the bend where Harrison went off. But it was really quite, you didn't think of East Orange, and you did, that was all South Orange. And I remember before the war broke out, uh, some children on Halloween, went to the Winters house at the bend of Harrison Street. When the butler opened the door, there was a huge picture of Hitler at the, at the end of the, the main hall. And the children started to talk. And that Winters left and went back to Berlin, was made a baron, and was uh, destroyed in the bombing of Berlin. The other Winters, Mike Winters, and the red brick house, they had a beautiful lawn that people came all over New Jersey to see. Ran out of Tremont Avenue up to uh, a block above Tremont Court. Uh, he stayed in this country. And this whole book is about Winters Brothers, and I almost am sure that Len Dayton must have gotten the germ of the idea from that when he began this novel. Someday I might kind of check him out and say. <coughs> That's all of us now. 
Beg pardon? I think they reviewed it. It's on the bestseller list. Oh, sure it is. Well, anyway, and Dayton writes. Yeah. If he wrote The Hour Father, it would be on the bestseller list. <laughs> uh, that, that's the way it goes. Uh, now I, I dig back into memory. Uh, you all know where 10 North Ridgewood is, that, that beautiful apartment house up there at the corner. Uh, my mother went to live there after my father died, and I came in one day and found her quietly laughing. And uh, since she was in her senses, I wasn't worried. Uh, and I said, uh, why are you laughing? Uh, where 10 North Ridgewood was, was a cow pasture. And as a little girl, she used to come along and watch the cows at 10 North Ridgewood. And then right over at the corner of what I think is called Church or Chapel Street, yeah. Church, 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 Church Street, Street. Street, there was a, a little store where you had cold, fresh milk and homemade cake. Mm -hmm. That was all they sold there. And as a little girl, my grandfather used to bring her there as a very special treat on Sundays for cold milk from the cows across the street at 10 North Ridgewood <laughs> and the cake that I guess the lady in the house baked. So isn't it wonderful, you know, even with, within the within two generations, how much history there is wrapped up in the village. I was looking through our archives uh, uh, about a week ago, and I knew that I was coming. We have bills to sick lies back to uh, 1880. And something I can't figure out, sick lies apparently supplied us with oysters. <laughs> and among the bills are three barrels of oysters, which somehow the sick lie must have gotten and shipped them up. They lived rather well in those days. I haven't seen an oyster at the wall since I've been there. Uh, uh, I think, for example, the, uh, 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 the Roth House on Center Street, it's gone now. It's where Hartman Court is. When I was a little boy, I, I would think that Mr. Roth ran a meat shop or a wholesale butchers in Orange, but he had a miniature racetrack in there and bred stable horses, where, where Hartford Court is today. And way down on Holland Road is the original house for the grooms, which has been modernized. But if you look, it's the only house that doesn't actually have a house on Holland Road. And I can remember when that was pulled down. If you go past uh, uh, Hartford Court rather slowly, uh, on the uh, on the southern side is a, a little piece of concrete, and uh, still in the grass where the shrubbery are, which is part of the great ornamental gateway that led into the, led into the royal house. Mm -hmm. So th th these kinds of things we were <coughs> readily fascinated by. Uh, I remember uh, my mother telling me uh, that she went to dances in Marylawn when it was the Stolnecht house. Stolnecht was apparently a New York banker. This is the present, the, the older of the Maryland buildings. I have a beautiful wall there, room even there now. One thinks of South Orange and uh, a, a rather simple house like the Stolnix having its own ballroom. His less fortunate brother lived across the tracks on the other side. <laughs> and that house is in terrible fitness repair. Uh, but to go from the houses with, with private ballrooms to today is, is not su such, a long, uh, such a long jump. Uh, I remember, and, and maybe some of you do, there used to be an apartment house at the corner of Terrell and South Orange, a great stucco where there's a doctor's office now. And I think that eventually that stuff kind of fell down, didn't it really? It got worse and worse and worse. And down it the went. Down that little tool stairs going up to nothing. That's right. There, there's the expert, huh? Uh, uh, when you think up on the uh, up on uh, Raymond Avenue, uh, the men and people had their ancestral mansion. Uh, the Colgates around the corner, of course, at Seven Oaks Park. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned before the Gray Orchids and the Hoyts, uh, that's caught us over at Liverpool's. And they had a beautiful house up there. And their housekeeper's sister was my mother's maid of honor. So that I spent a good deal of time <laughs> in the Gray Orchid house when I was growing up. Uh, so all of these things are built around this rather wonderful uh, village of ours. On Charlton Avenue uh, was the Woodbury House. The Woodbury Soap People, which later on the Strack family bought, Father Strack's family. They were tailors from downtown Newark. And I don't know if any longer, but when I was uh, in high school, and I, I guess in college too, uh, that house had all beautiful hand-painted ceilings uh, that had been done by the Woodbury people. And that's the kind of stuff that was in South Orange. Uh, I have a set of pictures home that I, I don't dare let out because if I did, my mother come back and want me. Uh, but when she and my father uh, went out walking, I think that was the term, with their brownie box. We have pictures of them on the steps of every mansion along Scotland Road. <laughs> <laughs> Looking as old were there, you know. And, uh, the old flower house, which we now call the Riker House, and is now a synagogue. 
and one can recognize all those houses in these pictures. Of course, the hat's like this, you know, the, the waist is like that. And uh, uh, again, this is this is only a second generation back. Uh, uh, where where the Noonans used to meet down here at the corner of Valley Street and South Orange was the Byrne Tavern. Uh, B y r n e. Uh, from whom come the Fitzsimmons family, who have been so prominent in South Orange, uh, Mike Fitzsimmons and his brother, uh, who between them ran the whole village, put the roads up the mountain. They didn't know a thing about engineering, but they got those roads up uh, uh, absolutely uh, zigzag. They did a wonderful, wonderful job, Mike and Tom. Huh? And one ran, I guess, the place and fire, and the other ran the, the streets. Uh, their daughters and time all came to work at Seton Hall. Well, their grandmother ran the old Burn Tavern, and that used to be a stopover on the horse and carriage route between New York and Buffalo. And it took one day to get from New York to the Burn Tavern in South Orange, and then you spent the night there and got fresh horses, and then went over the mountain. And that eventually boiled down into some, you may remember, about Lally's uh, a hardware store. But that was originally a village tavern. You look surprised, Rita, huh? No, I thought I remembered it at the corner of Valley Street. Valley Street. Yeah, where the park is now. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, and they have some of those old tobacco road pictures yes. with jury characters with hats and then pipes standing around the, the, the pillars on the porch. That was a little before my time, but uh, we understand. Huh? Uh, <coughs> I've always been told, and I don't know whether it's true or not, and I had to go to Mrs. O'Rourke on that, uh, but the house at the end of Grove Park with the candle snuffer roof that had a fire in some years ago was, was designed by Stanford White. And if you look at it, it's very, very obvious that it, it's a rather singular house. Uh, I think of, uh, I don't mean to scare you out of the village, but you know where, uh, what's that food store right in the village? Shoprite. 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 That building was closed for smallpox when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody in there had smallpox, they quarantined the building, and the people were shut, shut up in there, and they sent their food up with baskets on a rope. Yeah. Uh, so a quarantine went. Of course, that, it was a panic thing, but it swept through the village. Uh, like nobody was, and I never forgot, I always refer to that as a smallpox building. <laughs> <laughs> and that is a legend, of course, and that's, that's within my own memory. Uh, I think of Tuxedo Park. And while I'm not exactly teetering with age, I remember there were no houses there. Uh, we used to walk across that to get to Seton Hall. Uh, I can remember snakes uh, crawling around on the grass and some daisies and things like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, house that my mother and father bought was the last house in the Kilburn tract. Mm -hmm. You know where Kilburn Place is there outside Lady of Sorrows? Yeah. And that went all the way down to the Newark City line. Kilburn Church on South Orange was the same family and they bought it from the Indians. <coughs> so that while our house was unimportant and very small, and it only had two owners after the Indians, the Kil no, three, the Kilburns, the people ahead of us, and then the fields. And uh, that was the, la the last house. In fact, we were half in Newark and half in Tuxedo Park. Uh, then I, I think you probably have seen that uh, beautiful, exquisite, extraordinary red brick stable that we have up at Seton Hall, which is the center of our it's fine arts more. building. Well, some of you must remember the old brown house that stood at the end where the Archbishop lived. That house was built by Eugene Kelly, a very smart man. He went west in the gold rush. Instead of looking for gold, he sold shovels to those that did. <laughs> <laughs> and he made a fortune, became a banker, founded a bank in St. Louis, and came on to New York. And he owns that whole great cluster of red big buildings behind St. Andrews in downtown New York. That's part of his family's foundation. And this was his summer home. Uh, when the old archbishop lived there, he had coal stoves all over. There was no heating, no insulation, only one thing is the boards. A couple times there were fires. The wires were tacked down with staples. Uh, when Archbishop Walsh died, they could only allow two people in the living room at once because otherwise they and the coffin would have gone right down into the cellar uh, because the house was so far gone. Well, that belonged to uh, this Eugene Kelly, who was the trustee at Seton Hall and a trustee down at the, the orphan asylum there, which is now the St. Mary's Villas. And uh, he was the man who built the Lady Chapel in St. Patrick's in New York, one of the most beautiful buildings in America. He was a South Orange resident. Huh? And then he had two, he had one daughter, Helen Kelly. Well, she took off like a shot. She married Frank Gould of the Gould. And they were married by Cardinal McCloskey in the parlor of the uh, 
St. Patrick's in New York. Uh, Helen Kelly Gould uh, had two daughters by Frank Gould and then took off. And uh, she had two or three husbands after him. Uh, she almost made the throne of Albania. Uh, she married a Hungarian count, they all do. And then uh, after the Hungarian count, she married the brother of King Zog. When the Second World War broke out, she came back to this country and uh, lived at the Waldorf and was buried with great splendor in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. Everything having been wiped out, the memory had been wiped out, but she left two daughters. And each daughter, tax-free, got $250 million. Do oh. you recall the uh, Florence School, whose arts collection was sold about six months ago <coughs> at Sutherland Park for and they brought in $24 million? Yeah. That was the granddaughter of the man that owned the house at the end of our campus. Oh. I've been chasing her for years. There's no good. <laughs> <laughs> and the other daughter, whose name is Mrs. Conway, lives outside Mexico City. And we put our development department on, on asking her to come back and see Grandpa's stable. Uh, you never can tell if it might be very appealing to her. Of course, she also got the, uh, uh, the $250 million, and neither of them, both of them, are childless. As we know, Mrs. Gould has got that beautiful museum in the Riviera that she advertised at the time you go and stay there and, and study art. So again, all of these, these absolutely fascinating stories uh, about, uh, about South Orange. Uh, the house, of course, was finally pulled down. And all those years, by the way, Seton Hall didn't own the house. Seton Hall paid the bills. The Archbishop lived there, and we got the coal bills and the Rogers bills. But it was ours to have some property. But finally, uh, when Archbishop Baldwin moved out in order to save himself from being incinerated, uh, <laughs> he turned the house and the land over to the university. And as you know, it's one of the finest property lots in South Orange. <laughs> Incidentally, if you're not uh, with it, this is a little ahead, I suppose. One of our alumni has given us a third of a million dollars. We're going to build a beautiful ornamental gateway uh, facing Center Street on South Orange Avenue. You better tell your husband, Mr. Ross. That's so he does. <laughs> but even there, there's going to be a conflict with Seton Hall. Uh, not a real conflict, but a little triangle of ground yeah. was given by a Seton Hall alumnus by the name of Miles in memory of his brother, who was the first boy from South Orange killed in the First World War. And if you look there, there's a kind of a cast stone little uh, pillar uh, with a, a bronze cock on the top of it, referring to this Miles who died in the First World War. And he, now, I guess they kind of will just forget that. I'll be swept right out. There's going to be some kind of a circle there, you know. But again, that, that, that nexus between Seton Hall. By the way, Mr. Miles, who was a Seton Hall alumnus, he was the man who sold the Orange Lawn Tennis Club down on Montrose near Berkeley or Charlton and bought the property for $40,000. Oh. From Ridgewood to Wyoming, oh. and with the house on it. <laughs> so that even, oh, a long, a long time, Jack, because my mother went to dances in that house. And that was a long time ago. Huh? But, uh, and he got that, uh, we knew Mr. Miles very well. He, he lost all of his money and uh, we kind of took care of him toward the end. Uh, me held, he sent me out to find him, and he was reputed to have lost a million dollars one day on the old man delay between downtown New York and Atlantic Highlands. And uh, he was buried in the Seton Hall when he died. Uh, so again, that, that, that really, uh, that, that tie in between the hall and, and the town. Uh, uh, there used to be a beautiful house right across from that. Uh, Mary, would you help me? Was that the German or the German German house? They were coal dealers from down in Newark. No. Remember the big house with the white columns? Yes, sure. And the Smith and Smith tried to get out of a funeral parlor. Duffield lived there. Huh? Duffield. Uh, but then after that, these people came up from downtown. Uh, the village wouldn't let it become a funeral parlor. Look what's happened to it. It was a gorgeous house. Uh, with the most beautiful gardens and trees that you ever saw. And there were two old ladies who lived there finally who couldn't keep it up anymore. And the house just deteriorated and deteriorated. And that was right across from Seton Hall. Then it might surprise you to know that somewhere up on the mountain, uh, below where Grunning's uh, closed restaurant is, yeah. Seton Hall owned a great tract, a uh, hundred or so acres, where we went into summer encampment with our ROTC. And all the boys put on the uniforms, ran up and stayed on the mountain for a couple of months in the summertime. And I can't find any deed of sale on that, but obviously we, well, obviously we did sell it. <laughs> We'd be most anxious to claim it back now. Uh, the village, with I think great prudence, has limited the building we can do. Although you wouldn't believe it if you looked no. at the campus. <laughs> but I think we're only allowed now 
185,000 more square feet of building, if I recall correctly, Maria. Well, I think whatever's been approved is just that's about it. the limit. That's it. The uh, extra dorm is included yeah. in that. Yeah. I know they're having trouble out of the house on board price, yeah. although it's been passed, you know. So, uh, uh, that kind of thing. Now, uh, I, I, I don't think I will offend the, the Catholic pastor in the village, uh, but see, uh, Our Lady of Sorrows was founded out of C. Hall. Uh, they had no church, no parish, but there were Catholics to be taken care of. And for about 30 years, all the South Orange and Maplewood Catholics uh, and the Springfield Catholics all went to Seton Hall to Mass. Uh, they're, they're, that's why my grandparents were married there. Uh, then the village broke off, and in those days when the village, when the, they broke off, a priest from Seton Hall would run the parish. And he'd live at Seton Hall, and Seton Hall would pick up all the expenses. He would take the Sunday collection and bring it back to Seton Hall. I would refer you to let Father Morris know that. <laughs> I don't know much about the statute of limitations. But interestingly enough, St. Leo, Blessed Sacrament in Newark, St. Leo's in Irvington, St. James in Springfield, St. Rose's in Short Hills, and Our Lady of Stars were all founded out of Seton Hall and run by the priest personnel at the college before they developed a separate parishes. So again, the impact of Seton Hall and suburban Essex goes on all through the years. Uh, uh, there's a little house on Ward Place that they're about to tear down, that little wooden frame house with a porch out in front. My grandmother's brothers went to school, and that was a little schoolhouse. And farther down on Ward Place, near Irvington Avenue, there's a very old wooden house with a little porch running around the end. That was Bishop Bailey's residence. The college owned right to Irvington Avenue and then sold that off. <laughs> what a mistake that, what a mistake that was. Huh? And uh, uh, also, uh, don't get nervous, but if you come in through our magnificent new back gates at Seton Hall off Ward Place, you're driving right through a cemetery. Even when I was a little boy, the cemetery was still there with the, with the white birches, and then they eventually transferred the graves down the Holy Sepulcher. So even in those times, we had a space problem at Seton Hall. You dig them up and move them. <laughs> you, are, you are really crowded for space. Huh? Uh, I forgot to mention, too, something that the village has lost, and that uh, I'm sure that some of you will remember it. Uh, certainly from about Kingman Road up to uh, Prospect, there was a double row of elms on both sides of South Orange Avenue, on the curb and across the side. It was like walking through a cathedral. And of course, that Dutch elm disease hit, and they all went. It was absolutely magnificent. They were all the wine glass elms that, that uh, uh, it blended into one another, you know. And uh, I often think of that with regard. Although we had our own lane at Seton Hall of beautiful maples, and one of our presidents who wanted this is called the Maples Down. So we have a very bare front road coming up from the gate at the President's Hall. By the way, I'm going to do a little plug now. Uh, go by Seton Hall some night. We have now a beautiful indirect illumination on the chapel of the administration building. Obviously, Monsignor Patel is imitating the Archbishop, always the same man to imitate, and the uh, Archbishop has illuminated the cathedral. If you haven't seen that, by the way, take a look. The, uh, this has nothing to do with the lecture, Mrs. Cobb, I'm sure you understand. Uh, the cathedral down in Branchville Park is now recognized as the finest Gothic structure in America. It is absolutely incredible. And the new Archbishop has taken great interest in it. He's spending a million dollars a year for four years to put it back in shape. And the first thing he did was light it at night. You can see it from the George Washington and the Birds on the Bridges. Absolutely, that coming out of the absolutely incredible. That Bishop Bailey originally bought it, so it would be seen all over the uh, go up, if you can't afford High Lawn, that's all right, but go up to the grounds and look down and see the cathedral from Eagle Rock, and it, it's just absolutely incredible. And by the Mr. Catwalk, oh, here she is. If ever you want to do something, uh, we run tours through the cathedral, uh, groups of 30 or 40. I have to be the head of the tour group, Mr. Cow, and then uh, we spend an hour, an hour and a half. I'd like to be able to take my group. Well, that's fine. I'll send this Oh, no, it's up on the hill, man. We're very interested. And incidentally, we do this, fellas, and uh, this is, you know, your stuff, but we have Bruce come down at 10 in the morning, and we give them a tour, and then they go to DiBiase's for lunch. That sounds great. It's a very, very nice kind of view, and as some of you can go to the I need permission. No, I need permission from the library. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. And, uh, you know, if we get a raise, 
think we can arrange it. And as long as we can arrange it, I'm booking it. If I can sell a product, if you ask for the fields, you'll get us a tour guide. Wonderful. Yes, sir. I'm so excited. Well, thank you so much for coming. Okay. Let's go on. Now, that was a little side tour, but we are also aware of the cathedral. They're coming from all over. To tell you a funny story about it, if I may, that this is a reminiscence afternoon. As I'm sure you know, there's always been great rivalry between Newark and New York, ecclesiastical as well as financial. And of course, St. Patrick's was going up at the same time as Sacred Heart, the great cathedral on Fifth Avenue, which of course is kind of wedding cakey compared to ours. But originally, <laughs> Our cathedral was to face on Park Avenue, and Park Avenue originally was Fifth Avenue. And Bishop Bailey said, I'm not building my cathedral on Fifth Avenue. <laughs> so he turned it around the other way into the square, which is Sixth Avenue. So that that's why we're not on what is the main street, but very nice that the Essex County something or other is clearing out that great mound of dirt, and there's going to be a thousand car park plaza in front of the cathedral. Uh, with all short, it's going to be beautifully done just for the cathedral needs to enhance it. But come down, we'd love to have you and we'd love, love to give you the tour, huh? We had a group down last week and uh, one little boy was Jewish. And he obviously was a little ill in the United Are you nearly at well? He said, mm -hmm. So I took him and showed him the statue of Moses and everything was set. <laughs> he knew he was home free. And then I showed him Ezekiel and I showed him Isaiah and I showed him Jeremiah. And then he, then he felt perfectly at home. Everybody was just fine. Huh? Uh, I guess a few of you here now were into uh, Harriet's and Rita O'Rourke's territory. I uh, wonder there weren't many houses above Wyoming Avenue. And then after the Depression, uh, when all the people who below Wyoming area had lost their houses because they had bought more <laughs> before the credit sold short or something, and they were buying those houses at 10 cents on the dollar below Wyoming Avenue, then we pushed up into Newstead North and then a new addition, and Senator Friday lived up there in the village, had a real life senator living there, and his son Dean and I were very good friends. Uh, you might remember the little church it used to be down in Grove Park. Uh, why that? Why we didn't buy it, why the Catholics didn't buy it, why the non-Catholics had to go, I would never know if it was a lovely little church, but the town wanted it and took it over, and there was a, a lovely little frame structure, and the minister's house was right across the street. That's that red brick house right at the corner of, uh, what's the first street up, uh, Harry? Ralston, the corner of Ralston and the street along the park. A lovely, lovely little house. Uh, and I can remember playing in the ruins of the church before it was pulled down. I can remember too, and this I very much regret, there was a lovely brook that went through the little park. It's covered. It's covered. But I used to go up uh, on my mother's behest and get watercress out of the brook. Can you imagine getting watercress out of that brook now? But then, uh, and we used to sail boats there, made out of clothespins and matchsticks and things like that. That eventually they covered it, as, as I suppose the village improved a little. Uh, I remember too, and uh, once in a while I still get a little kick out of hearing it, uh, that great siren in the village blew every day faithfully at 8 and 12 and 6. You could set your watch by it, the whole village went by that. And, uh, but not three times a day. No, no, no. 8 o'clock and 6 o'clock. And why? Well, I never hear the 6 anymore. And they used to do it when you, that's how the kids knew there was no school. Uh, you'd get a triple blow around 8 o'clock and then kids would all listen very intently for that. Uh, I guess you know, too, uh, that Seton Hall once owned, uh, from the point where Turrell meets South Orange Avenue, all the way down Turrell to Grove Road to South Orange Avenue, that whole triangle. And I can remember that, as I maybe Mary can, too. We had a farm there with sheep and goats and, and uh, pigs and horses. I, I played there when I was a very small boy. And if you go down the Seton Hall Drive, there's one house there that doesn't match. Becker didn't build it. <laughs> and that was the original farmer's house for the, for the college farm, and he lived there. It's completely out of tune with the other houses, right as you go out on uh, the bottom of, of our front gate. And uh, we sold it. I, I think we had a, a president at that time who was not a, a businessman. And uh, they passed a law that we were not exempt from paying taxes. And we would pay taxes, uh, we'd be paying taxes for five acres on every building. We only had three or four buildings. So the tax was enormous, and uh, the tax people taxed us on the frontage along South Orange Avenue, which was ungodly. 
And of course, what Monsignor Mooney should have done was borrowed and paid back. Instead, he sold the land across to pay the back taxes, and we'd lost uh, something of an estimable value. Of course, he was a strange man in many ways. Uh, I'm going to be saying this uh, 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 week for Sunday night, or Saturday night at the hall for a, a celebration dinner. But in 1919 and 1920, he was striding across the campus, and somebody had on a record that was playing Gallicorci. And he stopped dead, dead in his tracks, and he called a special meeting, and he said he had heard the voice of a woman profane in the campus of St. Moore. <laughs> <laughs> he went and directed it, he smashed it, <laughs> and the boy almost got suspended. <laughs> that was only 65 years ago, but a woman's voice could have been thought of as profaning. Uh, things have changed. <laughs> very, very much. Um, I'm going to embarrass Mrs. Hamill, maybe, but I really don't care. Uh, right next to her house is the house where I believe is an Pugliese now live. Pugliese. Well, uh, uh, a long, long time ago, that was the Gillespie house. And the Gillespie's had two great mansions, the mansion of South Orange and Villa Walsh up in Morristown. There were two brothers who were financiers in New York. And the Gillespie, who owned the house uh, uh, next to Mrs. Hamill's, uh, married a soubrette, uh, Christy McDonald, who was a star of one of the great Broadway shows. And the uh, uh, Gillespie people didn't usually go around marrying soubrettes. Uh, but this was so phenomenal that when the Lackawanna pulled in on the street level tracks and they got off, the villagers had a carriage without horses and pulled Mr. Gillespie and Christy McDonald up to the house on the hill and they had a great ball on the lawn. Uh, to which the peasantry, like our friend, were invited <laughs> to come and see what was going on. And then I gather, I don't know if it was the 4th of July or not, but on certain great uh, occasions, uh, uh, the Gillespie's have a great fireworks show on the lawn. Uh, and people used to come from Orange and, and uh, Maplewood and, and East Orange to see it. And then over on, uh, I, I bring this on, I'm not sure it is South Orange, but over a little on, on Ridgewood Road, there's that little uh, kind of cream-colored colored stucco church on the corner. Mm -hmm. That was a skating pond when my mother was a girl. They had a little shack there, an open fireplace, and they all went skating there, then they filled it and built the chapel. And somewhere along the wall in front of Gillespie's house, there was a spring with very wonderful water, and the people used to come and bring bottles uh, to the mountain spring and bring the bottles home and have pure water. I think the fountainhead is probably still there, Rita, but I'm not sure it runs any longer. Silver Spring Road. Yeah, exactly. You got it. <laughs> Uh, so all these wonderful, wonderful stories. Now, we'll talk a little bit about Seton Hall because uh, uh, tell us an that I was going to, and I have that on the cards too, believe me. Uh, by the way, I want to say one more thing, and if Harriet corrects me, it's perfectly all right. Uh, we make so much fuss about Llewellyn Park. South Orange was about 50 years ahead of Llewellyn Park. If I remember from seeing some maps that Harriet showed me years ago, the Havenwires and the Vanderbilt and maybe the Esters bought the whole Montrose section for a housing development and then sold it off to their rich friends from New York. And that was really the first great bedroom community for the financiers. Am I, am I fairly right, Harry? I think so. I you know more than No, I not this, this lady. I, I go to her with what I want to know. But I remember she showed me these plots and I saw like uh, Havenwire's name written all over blocks of it. So that really we were ahead of Llewellyn Park. Not that that affected our boys. There's on record that our boys were, re were brought in for tampering with the gatehouse at Llewellyn Park in West Orange. They walked over one afternoon and fooled around there. Uh, and then I came across something. You might remember this, Harry, or, you know, put it in your memory box. Way back in the 17th century, a John Bailey from Long Island bought all the land from Elizabeth to West Orange. And he apparently was Bishop Bailey's great grandfather. And then he sold off to, they bought it from the Indians, but it was the Bailey tract. And I stumbled on that quite by accident. And then his great grandson was the one who founded Seton Hall in South Orange. Then uh, Bishop Bailey's uh, mother's family bought Roseville Park, which is now in Maplewood. And they bought at the same time that Bailey, James Roseville Bailey, uh, was president, uh, Bishop of Newark. And I have a hunch there was something going on there. <laughs> In other words, the bishop wanted to uh, equip his diocese with followers and wanted to get his college going. 
<laughs> and he called Uncle Nicholas Roosevelt, and Nicholas came out and had this huge, the whole stone wall is still there in Maine, but on this one street, I guess it's called Roosevelt Parkway, isn't it? And that came out of the man who put Seton Hall in South Orange, James Roosevelt Bailey, who was twice a Roosevelt. His mother and his grandmother were both Roosevelt's. He was uh, Eleanor's second cousin, Theodore's first cousin, and Franklin's fifth cousin. I wish that could be arranged, but that's the way it rearranged, but that's the way it is. Uh, and as a, he founded uh, Seton Hall, as you know, up in, in the Convent Station, up where the Sisters of Charity are now, in an old house that used to be a school run by a French teacher, Madame Chegaray, who came from Bayonne. Now, whenever they got a teacher French to come from Bayonne in 1845 eludes me completely. But however, he bought that house, and then uh, in two years, he said, I think we should do better, and came down to South Orange. And my great-grandfather was in the carriage with him when they came down, and he said to him, I wonder if we could get this, and they had to go, and because it was the church, they had to buy it under an assumed name, because in those days they wouldn't sell land to Catholics. And it was a beautiful marble house there. Uh, it belonged to a man called Elphinstone. He and his brother lived there and had a fight, and they moved out. And so that we got the land. Uh, there's, I don't find any record of what we paid for it, but we had all of that land. We had the land along Seton Place. We had that great triangle opposite. And then even when I was a little boy, we owned all along South Center Street, where all those houses are now, where Marie Riley lived and where uh, Dr. The, the Greek doctor from St. Michael's had his house, Nick Antonius. Oh, yeah and people like that. We uh, And I saw some of that land being sold and the houses going up when I was a little fella. Uh, that was one of the reasons, by the way, that Archbishop Walsh demanded that the gym be put down there in the back corner. We couldn't have been in the worst place. There was a swamp and a couple of rivers, and they argued with him, and he simply raised his voice ten levels and said, you heard me. <laughs> and his, uh, his determination was to block any further development. He cut off Woodbine near he cut off Center Street. We've had to have some pumps going since 1939 <laughs> to keep the building afloat. <laughs> but it's, it's a marvelous building. And someday, if you want to look at it, uh, they dug case, they sank caissons into the earth, great cement caissons, and then put these huge steel arches. And that whole building hangs like a suspension bridge from seven steel arches. Even the Russians came to copy it. This was 1939. It was a great architectural triumph. And actually, that building is suspended over a marsh because Archbishop Wall said, you heard me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how the gym got to be there. So at any rate, they, they got, the, uh, they got the, the land, and it was a beautiful marble bill, the Elfin Stone bill. We do have pictures of that. Maybe someday we could put them on display in the library for us. Uh, and they moved the college and the seminary down, uh, and then the house burned down. They put up another building, uh, of which there's one floor left. That's called Stafford Hall. An interesting building, it was four stories high, and it had three fires, and each time after a fire they put a, a roof over what was left. So we're down to one floor and a roof, and it's still a very usable building. Uh, then they built the administration one, which we now call President's Hall. Uh, that went up in 63-64, and they built the chapel in 63. We're about to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the chapel this year. And uh, we are pretty sure, I have to go to Columbia next week and check it out over in Avery, but we think that either Updike or uh, 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 Renwick, either Updike or Renwick built the chapel. He was a close intimate, an intimate friend of Bishop Bailey's, and he did the, uh, the bishop's house down in Bordentown. He did St. Patrick's in New York, did Trinity. And Ralph Adams Cram once said that they thought the Seton Hall Chapel was the most perfect uh, country Gothic chapel in the United States. You're welcome to come up see it, by the way. We, 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 you know, we very, very much uh, hope that we're going to have it done over. So the college, uh, Bishop Bailey was a very smart man. Uh, he got a charter from the state in the days when the state was less cautious or less anxious to dominate than it is now. And the charter permits us to do anything we want for as long as we live. And while there are, there are three, I think uh, Centenary may have it and Drew may have it. They were smart together then, so we wanted to go to a university. We didn't have to be chartered. We could open any school we please without the state's permission. Uh, we do have the state qualifying us because we don't want to do anything that is second rate. So that uh, he founded the school, and it was supposed to be uh, not just for the education of priests, although a great many people thought so, uh, but it was also to educate uh, the immigrant Irish 
who could not rise in the world because of a lack of education. Just as we're concerned now with, say, the Spanish and the Puerto Ricans and trying to let them get uh, culture so they can compete with those who have gone ahead of us. And, and the whole school was built around that. And of course, he was most anxious to uh, have him raised as a, a future uh, uh, Catholic uh, intellectual lady as well. And they built the, the presence hall and then the, uh, uh, the chapel. Then there was a grammar school there many, many years ago. And then uh, that closed after a while became a laundry, and the, uh, the prep went up the two white buildings that you know, Duffy Hall and Mooney Hall, and then Monsignor Minotti came along, can't be good to him, and he was decided he'd make it a university uh, on, the, on what was left of our property, the half of it, and we opened a med school and a law school and a graduate school of education, a graduate school in chemistry. Uh, he spent about ooh, $20 million in 10 years, about 800000 in the bank when he went. Uh, absolutely an incredible man. And uh, out of the, his, his kind of thinking came into the endowment that the university has. But you would be surprised perhaps someday if we get that in an exhibit down here, the rules that were laid out about the seminaries and the students going to South Orange Village. <laughs> Rule one was they were not to go. <laughs> <laughs> Number two was if they did go, they were, had to be preceded and followed by two monitors who would be responsible for their conduct while in the village. Then there was one day a month when they were allowed to go to the barbers. The barbers were not supposed to fall off that day because they all had to go the same day. Uh, Dr. Freeman used to come in. He was a very famous doctor here in South Orange. He used to come in and treat us. And, uh, you know, they, they, I've heard a few meetings at the hall, and they make a big deal about a strain between the university and the village. And I've never thought the strain existed. I lived in the prep, I lived in the college, we went back and forth to the village, our fellow students did. Uh, uh, I, I never knew how running could fail from the hydrogen we brought it down there. And then the other ice cream store that was up just this side of the town hall, Jensen's or something like that, where we used to go. And, and uh, uh, when I lived there, we had our shoes cobbled in the village, we had our, our suits tailored or our press in the village. Uh, the Chinese laundryman, I think, retired, grew rich <laughs> on the money the priests spent down there having a linen college done. And I feel absolutely sure that Ramosa retired on, on the stuff that Seton Hall and people like you bought there went out to his big house in Bernardsville. Uh, but all through the years, I suppose, there are individual people who are in the village who are unhappy and individual Setonians who misbehave. Uh, we always get a great cry from South Center Street and Varsity Road. And uh, maybe they're entitled. But, you know, if you buy a house on the edge of a university campus, uh, what do you expect? A cemetery? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, I, I know some of our students are inconsiderate. I think sometimes the people over complain. But it seems to me if you buy within a half mile of a university, excuse me, Reedy, you're out of your mind. <laughs> because you take what goes with it. And uh, uh, we once had a man who was a president for only two years, unfortunately. And he planned to buy that whole block, Ward Place to Riggs, and then that one block and up. Gardner, is it, Rita? And tear down all those houses and build a faculty with a court inside for parking. Cost four million. Uh, he only lasted two years. But it was a wonderful idea, really and truly. Huh? And it would have extended the campus. And we know that people are irritated by our cars on the streets. Uh, but again, what do we do? Uh, a lot of space is gone now while we're building. But I must assure you that even with the building and the parking off streets, we have increased the parking area by 102 spaces. And when the new buildings are finished, the parking area will be increased by 500 spaces. Oh. Now, this is part of the insistence on the village. They want the buildings up on the piles so we can park underneath. And in the meantime, to make our kind of use of the village, we rented that lot over at Ivy Manor. Uh, and we shuttle them back and forth. We have security man attendants all day long. But I really, I'm not, I think I'm not being prejudiced, but I really and truly really, uh, have always found that the, the give and take between the village and the university has been absolutely wonderful. I was told to Mrs. Ross before, and maybe fellowship could help on this, uh, we would be delighted to have your mailing list and put you on our mailing list. Uh, I hear so many people say, Father, we only knew what was going on at the yes, hall. Yes, yes. And if only we could let you know, because we've got wonderful programs. Yes. Most of them are free. Some are a little expensive. Yes. But it saves going to New York. We've got a dreamer group there that's great. Yes. As you know, in the summertime, we do one mystery, one social comedy, and one musical. 
We've had eight poets in this year, once a month. Uh, welcome to Walt Thomas. Good parking, except on Monday nights, which is very heavy now. Uh, night school night. But if, if you would give me a mailing list, I'll stick it right into others. Uh, because, uh, as I said to Mrs. Ross, really and truly, uh, we are here in the village. Uh, all the village people can use our library if they get a card because we feel we owe the village something. Uh, we would like to give the collection of very wonderful talent, uh, like you know that uh, the man that uh, won the $300,000 gift last year, Father Jockey, well he's one of the most famous teachers in the world, he's on our campus. Uh, he should be enriching the village as well as just the university. I want to pay back for all those magazines I read for eight years, you see. Uh, now, I'm, I'm, I must tell you, yes. Uh, Seton Hall has agreed to publish a list of their activities in Profiles, which is the Chamber of Commerce oh, publication. It goes to everybody in South Orange and Maple oh, Creek. So Jim Allison is going to Oh, fine. Well, do Jim that. says that he'll do it. There's yeah. nobody like Jim Allison. I do have to say that. Huh? And we are having a newsletter from this group that was started, and we will be putting in things. Oh, and South uh, Seton Hall has been wonderful to my, I have to say that I've gotten the best speakers such as you. Well, and and, want to be, and, so all, and the they have been so cooperative. Not one professor has turned us down, and they do not uh, condescend to the group. They talk to them, and it's wonderful. Uh, what I, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to tax your patience. One other little thing I forgot to tell you. <coughs> With about Seton Hall, of course, I have been there, as you know, a very, very long time. Uh, there used to be a forest out back where that big parking lot is. And there was a lake out there where I went ice skating as a little boy. As my, my mother and her family went ice skating before me. And there used to be deer in that forest and pheasant. And I can remember when a friend of mine and I were reading Desire Under the Elms. We went down to the forest to read it. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to be caught reading either that or Strange Interlude while we were still in high school. And then that lake behind Seton Hall went down into a little stream that flowed along South Center Street. And there were three ponds along South Center Street. Mary McManus's house was alongside of one of them, Mary. Then it went down Cameron Road to my mother's and father's house, and there was a dairy barn there and a small pond. And because there was a dairy barn there, we had roses the like of which you never saw. <laughs> they just grew and grew and grew. And in the beginning, we couldn't understand why the ground was so fertile and why the roses did so very well. But that, that's within memory of some people still in the village, huh? So you've been very good to listen to me now. And of course, I obviously like to talk about it. To get us there from South well, the South Orange bus or your own car or walk. How about a van take us to the places that yeah. you spoke about? Well, that's to talk to her. You know, a uh, long time ago, there was a society here that seems to have disappeared. Uh, no, that, that I was president of that, that disappeared. Uh, South Orange Neighbors, it was called. Yeah, very active. It still is. Well, they wrecked the historical society. But one day, they ran buses every hour. Yeah. Out of the South Orange Station, I know, because I rode the buses, yeah. mm -hmm. and we went all, and we do, and uh, I, Mary. Now I'm really going to embarrass you. Mary's grandmother came to South Orange. Oh, and Harriet's yeah. too. Yes. <laughs> and they actually, at one time, rented an octagonal house. Was your mother born in that house? No, they just had it for the summer. I see. Yeah. She was born someplace on the Yeah, yeah. Up. yeah. But they had an octagonal house. Now, was a, you know, there's only four left in the United States. Basketball is one. And the McCaves were there for, imagine coming up from Newark to spend your supper in South Orange. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Yeah. McCabe and her dead children and all the rest of it. And finally Mrs. McCabe settled on the, uh, 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 Stanley Road. But the story is this, the day that we, that I went around in the bus with the people, I think I made nine trips. I say, McCabe's live there, McCabe's live there, McCabe's live there. <laughs> and they, they're in the Montrose section, they're in Tuxedo Park. George McLaughlin was McCabe, was up on the top of the mountain. Well, finally, by the third trip, all the Magnier children were out on the, on the, on the grass waving as we went by because they know I was pointing out a McCabe descendant's house. And that was, that's just one family. I'm sure there's other families like that in South Orange. But they were and are South Orange, even though Mary has left us now, but still came with us. But uh, that was one thing they did. That, that was a wonderful day, and everybody enjoyed it so much, huh? It was a fatiguing day, yes, but for I, you I, it was I enjoyed it tremendously. And you could break the village up, you know, Tuxedo Park, Montrose section, General Village, 
and then up in Newstead. We did it in the fourth section, and we just had a marvelous day. Huh? Thank you for being so patient. <laughs>